not uh, offered as a, a statement showing uh, consciousness of guilt. If it were offered for that purpose, uh, the defendant uh, would have insisted that all of his statements uh, explaining the cuts on his finger be admitted, uh, including the statement he made to the detectives uh, at the time of, of his arrest. Uh, since it was offered only for the limited purpose of explaining the, the opinion of, uh, of Dr. Bodden, uh, the, the jury did not hear the full explanation offered by the defendant uh, in, in all of the settings in which an explanation was, was offered. Uh, and we believe we would be entitled to offer that if that were the purpose uh, for which this statement was coming in. The only other uh, suggestion of any evidence uh, that would justify this instruction uh, is the evidence of the statements made by the defendant to the limousine driver as to uh, uh, the explanation for, for why he was uh, running late. Um, and, and once again, uh, to, to construe this as a, uh, a false exculpatory statement uh, uh, in a setting in which uh, the, the defendant was not being called upon to uh, explain himself in the sense of, uh, of being confronted with any sort of accusation of, uh, of crime. We believe that that statement, uh, likewise, would not justify this instruction. So we object uh, simply on the grounds that there is no evidence to justify this instruction. Mr. Kelber. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, as the court is well aware, the Kimball case, 44 Cal 3rd, has stated quite clearly that a statement of a defendant offered against him by the opposing party, uh, which would serve to connect the defendant to the commission of the offense, qualifies as an admission in California. And although there may be differences of view by theoreticians of the rules of evidence as to whether that is sound on the theory of is it being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, the bottom line is that with respect to the cuts, the prosecution's contention is those were false statements made by Mr. Simpson to give an explanation for cuts and possibly abrasions that were sustained as a result of his efforts in killing and murdering these two human beings. And that his falsification of statements to justify these cuts and these abrasions serves to connect him through consciousness of guilt to the uh, commission of these two murders. Likewise, the fact that the defendant apparently told Mr. Park that he was asleep, even though the evidence clearly shows that shortly after 10 p.m., using his cell phone, he made a call to Paula Barbieri, uh, is evidence of a falsification to justify where he was at the time the murders were committed, and to demonstrate, again, consciousness of guilt by trying to form an alibi, if you will, for that period of time. Under the law, these qualify as admissions. When Dr. Bodden was asked, this was not 801B uh, information which was limited to the basis of an expert opinion. It was evidence which was offered as Mr. Simpson's statement. It qualified as an admission, as the prosecution, we are the opposing party, the defendant being the adverse party. We are offering his statement through Dr. Bodden against Mr. Simpson. It qualifies as an admission. 2.03 is properly given. All right, any response? Matter submitted? All right, the objection will be overruled. All right, 2.06. This is a uh, modified instruction specifically uh, dealing with the uh, glove demonstration. Mr. Ullman. Uh, Your Honor, 2.06 uh, refers to the defendant attempting to suppress evidence um, or concealing evidence or destroying evidence. <clears throat> The whole, uh, and, and as I understand it, the, the prosecution's theory of offering this instruction uh, is to suggest that the demonstration of the fit of the glove uh, was somehow an attempt by the defendant to uh, uh, suppress or mislead or uh, conceal uh, evidence in this case. The defendant did not offer this evidence. This evidence was offered by the people. And the theory on which uh, they were entitled to do that is that this was not testimonial. The whole idea of a defendant being required to stand before a jury uh, and try on clothing 
uh, is that it is not testimonial. It is simply observational, so, so the jury can draw a conclusion uh, whether, whether it fits or not based on their observation. If it were testimonial, or if it were being offered for a testimonial purpose, we would have a serious constitutional violation of requiring the defendant to incriminate himself uh, in front of the jury. Uh, and the offering of this instruction uh, is, is a suggestion by the people that they want to offer this demonstration now for a testimonial purpose, uh, and to infer from it that the defendant's conduct in participating in that uh, uh, demonstration can be used to incriminate him uh, of, the, of the crime of which he is accused. Uh, so we would, we would object to this instruction. Uh, we would assert the defendant's Fifth Amendment uh, constitutional privilege as the basis of our objection uh, and suggest to the court that giving this instruction and allowing that argument uh, is to create grave constitutional peril in terms of using uh, a non-testimonial demonstration for a testimonial purpose. People? Yes, Your Honor. Um, just for the record, and the court was uh, made aware, I only got involved in this because the court freed me up yesterday by ruling that uh, the two witnesses, Martz and Whitehurst, were not going to be heard. So I kind of come into the jury instructions uh, a bit late. The people on reflection believe that the instruction that has been offered in the packet that was sent in some time ago should not be the one given. We propose that the standard Calgic instruction of 2.06 more appropriately um, accommodates the evidence in the case. For example, Mr. Hodgman points out to me there is evidence that has been received that the defendant, when arriving at Los Angeles Airport uh, from his residence, in the uh, late evening, I gather, of uh, June 12th, uh, was seen to deposit a bag in a trash receptacle at the airport. Uh, that certainly would qualify, given the totality of the evidence, as efforts to suppress evidence, because it is reasonable for the jury to infer that the defendant was getting rid of incriminating evidence. The glove episode, the jury saw it. It is evidence in this case. The jury can determine whether Mr. Simpson, in fact, intentionally made an effort to make it appear that gloves which would fit did not, in fact, fit. And therefore, Your Honor, there is clear evidence that qualifies as efforts to suppress evidence by the defendant from which a consciousness of guilt may be drawn. But because there are multiple areas that reflect this effort to suppress evidence, I don't believe the instruction that has been proposed initially, which focuses on the glove, is appropriate. I think it should be a generic instruction, the standard Calgic, with the appropriate striking out of the inapplicable uh, alternative phrases as found in that instruction. All right, do you, Dean Ullman, do you have any comment on the just giving the generic 2.06? Yes, we oppose 2.06, and People versus Hannon uh, holds that this should not be given uh, if there is not evidence which it believed would, uh, would support the suggested inference. And there simply is no evidence in here of any uh, suppression or attempt to uh, conceal or, uh, or destroy evidence by the defendant. Uh, the argument that uh, uh, the testimony of a, of a witness that uh, Mr. Simpson set a, uh, a piece of luggage down on top of a, of a trash container uh, is certainly not evidence of an effort to suppress or destroy or, or conceal evidence. There was no testimony uh, as to what ultimately happened in terms of uh, whether that was then picked up and carried on. There was no evidence that uh, anything was was destroyed or concealed at that time. It is the rankest speculation uh, to argue that that supports any sort of inference of the concealment or destruction of evidence. Uh, and with respect to the glove demonstration, again, uh, we would urge that uh, there is serious constitutional peril. Well, let's uh, not get into that because that's been withdrawn. Okay. All right, the objection to uh, 2.06 will be sustained. All right, 2.21.2.
this is a witness willfully false and Mr. Ullman you've offered your own special instruction defendant special instructions 19 and 20. Yes, it was offered uh, in the substitution for uh, uh, 2.212 uh, because we believe the, the probability of proof uh, standard uh, used in 2.212 uh, would uh, confuse the jury in terms of the, uh, the prosecution's burden of proving its case beyond a reasonable doubt. So we rely on, uh, on people versus rivers. Uh, to, to qualify this instruction and uh, would urge the court to give uh, defendants 19 rather than 221.2. Mr. Cover. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, of course, this uh, instruction 2.21.2 has been approved uh, Throughout uh, recent case law, most recently, People v. Beardsley at 53 Cal 3rd, 68, pages 94 to 95. The Rivers case de dealt with a situation of, it's basically, it's a one-on-one -on -one case without any corroboration. And so there were concerns raised in the Rivers case. But whatever the facts of Rivers, Rivers is a court of appeal case. It cannot overrule, under our rules of stare decisis, a decision from the California Supreme Court approving 2.21.2. More fundamentally, in looking at D19, the court will notice that this has been truncated by leaving off several things. On the first sentence, the last words uh, that would appear in 2.21 is, is to be distrusted. The words in others have been left off. And then, of course, the last part, which is really the big issue, the part dealing with that uh, you may reject the whole testimony of a witness who willfully has testified falsely as to a material point unless, from all the evidence, you believe the probability of truth favored his or her testimony in other particulars. In other words, it is misleading to this jury to give the proposed D-19 because it suggests that if a jury finds a will, witness has willfully lied, basically you throw away everything else that witness has said. That is not what the law is. And as a result of Beardsley, as a result of the long recognition of this instruction, and as a result of the inaccuracy and misleading character of D-19, we submit the pattern standard Calgic instruction should be given. All right, any comment on D-20? Yes, um, unfortunately, Your Honor, my card index, I don't think, my card index has not come. No, but if you... Um, yes, I think this is. Thank you. Um, the issue of materiality as to the credibility of a witness is a question of fact for the jury. The uh, proposition that is posited in D20 that it is the responsibility of the court to make a finding as a matter of law that something is material. Number one is drawn from the perjury charge and the question of whether the materiality element of a perjury charge is a question of law or a question of fact. In the Calgic use note for the most recent uh, modification of 7.20, the Hedgecock case is cited at 51 Cal 3rd 395, and it stands for the proposition that where the issue of materiality is in dispute, it is a factual issue for the jury. I believe Dean Ullman believes that that is not what Hedgecock stands for and relies uh, Hedgecock citing earlier United States Supreme Court cases, but there is a recent case, this term from the United States Supreme Court called U.S. versus Gaudin, G-A-U-D-I-N, which can be found at 115 Supreme Court 2310, which found that um, due process and the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial required a trial judge to submit to the jury the question of materiality of defendants' allegedly false statements in matters 
within the jurisdiction of a particular federal agency. And this was the case, we were, for the record, in chambers. I mentioned that uh, I was aware of a case. Unfortunately, I didn't bring my materials, but uh, someone has uh, sent down a copy of the case. I have it if the court wishes to review it for its consideration of this issue. The setting aside the difference between an element of an offense and this question of materiality and due process requiring a jury to make a finding. Uh, in fact, I would be shocked, quite frankly, if Mr. Simpson were charged with perjury and the court was going to make a decision as a matter of law that the statement in issue was material and the court was going to tell the jury that it was material if they found the statement was made, I would be shocked if Dean Ullman didn't stand up and tell this court it was unconstitutional under due process in the Sixth Amendment for this court to do so. It would be a question of fact for the jury. It is a question of fact for the jury if any statement about which a witness may have lied is material. Because then the jury must decide if it is material, they are to uh, distrust the witness in other particulars unless, again, from the probability of truth, they find that the witness's testimony in other areas should be accepted. So it is a question for the jury, and that's where it should be left. D20 should not be given. Any response, Dean Ullman? Uh, Your Honor, if I could return very briefly to D19. Uh, we believe the modifications uh, proposed there are appropriate. First of all, uh, 221.2 uh, is ambiguous when it suggests that a witness who is willfully false in one material part of his or her testimony is to be distrusted in others because the suggestion is that the others may be other material parts. And we believe that if a witness is false in one material part of his testimony, in any other part of the testimony, he can be distrusted. And that is what is conveyed by saying simply the witness is to be distrusted, period, uh, without adding the ambiguous phrase, in others. Uh, we believe the modification uh, suggested by People versus Rivers uh, is appropriate here because we are dealing with the testimony of a sole percipient witness. The only witness to the discovery of the glove uh, is Detective Furman. Uh, and we believe to instruct uh, the, the jury with respect to his testimony uh, in terms of the qualifying phrase of using a probability uh, of truth standard uh, creates the very problem that uh, Rivers was addressing, uh, that of creating ambiguity as to the prosecution's burden of proving its case beyond a reasonable doubt. So we believe those modifications are appropriate. Now, with respect to the instruction that uh, we've requested in uh, our special instruction number 20, uh, materiality is a legal question. The, the holding of the Hedgecock case uh, was simply that in a prosecution for a witness uh, making a knowingly false material statement uh, in a government application, the question, as the, as the court held, of whether the defendant knew the statement was material is a jury question. But the California Supreme Court did not in any way undermine the support for the proposition that even in a perjury prosecution, the question of whether the statement was material is a legal question, and it is not inappropriate. Uh, and I don't believe the U.S. Supreme Court uh, case in the context of federal prosecutions undermines this proposition at all. It is a legal question, and the court must instruct the jury as a, as a matter of law uh, what is material and what is not. And of course, it's a very different question where the defendant on trial uh, is asserting his right to, to a jury trial. That, that question doesn't come up at all in the context of the testimony of a witness. So in the context of giving the jury an instruction that they can disregard the testimony of a witness who has given willfully false testimony with respect to a material part of his testimony, the jury should not be left simply to determine on, his, on its own uh, whether the, the testimony related to a material part of the testimony. The court has already 
determine that question as a matter of law and should so instruct the jury that it has found with respect to that testimony it was material. All right. Thank you, counsel. All right. D20 singles out an individual witness out of all of the witnesses that this court has heard, and that in and of itself is an inappropriate basis for a jury instruction. All right. Thank you, counsel. All right. I think 2.21.2 is the appropriate instruction to give in this situation. The objections to D19 and D20 will be sustained. All right. 250, 250.1, 250.2, Evans of other crimes. And also we are cross-referencing this to D22. give 250 as modified 250.1 250.2 and will decline to give 22 d 22 23 and 24 all right 2.52 flight after commission of crime that has been withdrawn by the prosecution that is correct all right take it there's no objection to withdrawal all right 
2.71, 2.71.5, 2.72, and 2.71.7. Uh, Mr. Brown, on my in the printer dates. Your Honor, Mr. I'm sorry, could I just interject one thing? In the series of instructions we have in the big packet, just to make a note of, on 2.13, which is the issue of the admissibility of prior inconsistent statements for the truth of the matter asserted, that that needs to be modified to take into account the Pilatus video, which came in under 1202, such evidence not being admissible for the truth of the matter asserted. All right. Remind me to do that when we conclude this cycle. All right, uh, Dean Ullman. Our objection to all of these instructions, uh, I believe 271.5 and 271.7 have been withdrawn. 271.5 and 271.7 is withdrawn, and I still I need to talk about I'm sorry, 271.5, the act of admission. All right. Instruction is withdrawn, and I need a moment to talk further with Mr. Hodgman on 271.7. We're trying to review the record on that. Withdrawn. All right. With respect to 271 and 272, Your Honor, I believe that uh, Your Honor's previous ruling uh, that you will give uh, 2.03 uh, with respect to uh, false exculpatory statements should be dispositive. Uh, there are no statements uh, that by any stretch of the imagination can be called an admission um, in this record. Uh, Section 2.03 certainly gives the prosecution the option of arguing that, uh, uh, that statements uh, uh, were, were false exculpatory statements and uh, the jury can infer some uh, consciousness of guilt uh, from those statements, but that does not make those statements admissions um, and there is no evidence in this record uh, of any admission and to instruct the jury um, that there is in the absence of any uh, sufficient evidence to justify a, a finding of any sort of, uh, of admission by the defendant uh, would be error. Uh, and uh, we, we would cite People versus Hannon for that proposition. Uh, there must be legally sufficient evidence in the record uh, uh, to support the finding of an, of an admission before this instruction can be given. And giving the instruction would itself suggest to the jury uh, that they are free to consider such evidence as an admission. Or that there has been an admission in the first place. I'm Mr. Kelber. As to whether there's been an admission, Your Honor, for the same reasons, under Kimball, the statements of the defendant to Dr. Bodden and the statements uh, to Mr. Park regarding being asleep constitute admissions because the people use those statements to connect the defendant to the commission of the offense through other evidence. But don't you have what what you appropriately need to argue under 2.03. We certainly have what is an appropriate instruction, Your Honor, but 2.03 does not create the understanding of the nexus. That is, what is an admission? What is it about a statement of a defendant that can be used by the prosecution to argue that the defendant is guilty of the offense? It is the fact that in the eyes of the law, a statement of the defendant which with other evidence tends to commit, connect him to the commission of the offense, qualifies as the kind of statement that can be admitted for the jury's consideration. That's what 2.71 is, uh, is all about. So there is nothing, they are not instructions that are in lieu of each other. They are parallel instructions to deal with 
sometimes different situations but sometimes very similar situation well, let's go back to what we classically understand to be an admission an oral admission by a defendant can you point to anything in the record here that even comes close to that well your honor as the court is well aware I understand your your position but I assume mr. Hodgman or mr. Clark or mr. Yokelson or anybody else would whisper in your ear oh, if there oh, was no, something that's, that was that that's not the thing I'm concerned about I think it's an interesting issue from a theoretical standpoint because hearsay is classically defined as which is why we have the two most theoretical thinkers here discussing this are you referring to mr. Yokelson because no. I hope the court is not referring to me I don't think I'm that theoretical but it's uh, a situation your honor where 2.03 certainly is there for us to argue the significance of it legally 2.71 is an accurate statement of law it's an accurate statement of law but is there anything you can point to that it applies to yes legally under Kimball what I indicated what the court is really suggesting is that it is not the classic kind of situation that is clearly a statement which is on its face inculpatory which is the classic being offered for the truth of the matter asserted so for example if the defendant lives out of state and is charged with a crime that was committed in Los Angeles County and the defendant made a statement to the police that I was in Los Angeles County during the evening hours of June 12 1994 that would be an admission because it would tend to connect him in some tangential way to the Commission of the offense if he went on to say and when I was in Los Angeles on June 12 1994 I was uh, down in Long Beach uh, at some event when the crime in question took place in Brentwood that would qualify as an admission that's why it's not a confession because it is not an acknowledgement of each element of the offense but it qualifies as an admission because we can take the part that uh, applies to him being in Los Angeles County at the relevant time and connect him to the offense even though he also wants to claim through an exculpatory portion that it is um, not him who is the perpetrator mr. Uh, Hodgman does point out he didn't need to whisper he wrote a note uh, to remind me to raise the issue of the ship dream comment I think the court indicated to us in chambers you believe an instruction is going to be appropriate as to how the jury should uh, evaluate that testimony and that would itself seem if the jury finds it to be of the nature which the court feels would be something they can consider that would qualify as an admission as well under 2.71 uh, so from a theoretical standpoint your honor I think Kimball's not a well-decided case and 2.03 takes care of it but under starry decisis Kimball controls 2.71 applies it is not redundant to 2.03 with the dream uh, issue it is clearly not redundant to 2.03 and on that basis your honor I ask the court to give 2.71 and 2.72 all right counsel I'm going to uh, take this one under submission let me uh, mr. Uh, um, Kelberg, would you approach just for a moment? Let me give you a draft and share one with Dean Ullman regarding a special instruction regarding Mr. Ship. Contemplate that and we'll come back to it. All right, let's move on to 3.31 and 3.31.5 mental states. I take it you want me to give 290? Your Honor, I find 290 to be one of the most favorable instructions to the prosecution. All right. This is a 94 revision. All right, 3.31.5, mental state. Your Honor, and you are going to, the people are going to submit a modified instruction. Correct, Your Honor, in accordance with uh, our conversation in chambers. Should have it early this afternoon available. All right, and, and that is over the objection of the defense because I'm going to direct the prosecution to submit the uh, 3.31.5, uh, including the mental states or uh, specific intents that are necessary for uh, murder in the first degree and murder <coughs> in the second degree. So the defense objection is noted. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right. All right, 4.71 is withdrawn by the people. And our next objection goes to 8.70.
Your Honor, can I briefly add one other thing for the court's consideration on the admission issue Mr. Hodgson points out to me? Just a piece of evidence, not right. a legal argument. All of the 1101 evidence that has been received, which includes statements of the defendant, which I believe are made uh, in tape recordings, and, as well as interviews with uh, the police officer or police officers who testified, would qualify as admissions since the 1101B evidence is admissible for the purposes of proving the defendant's guilt of the charged offenses. All right. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd like to comment on that because I think that highlights the, the risk of prejudice of giving 271 and 272. Uh, statements of admission of prior uh, similar crimes that are offered for the limited purpose of showing uh, the, the intent or motive or common scheme or plan are not admissions of the crime for which the defendant is on trial. The 271 and 272 specifically address the admission of the offense that the defendant is being tried for, and 272 cautions the jury uh, with respect to uh, a finding of guilt based upon that, that evidence. To suggest to this jury that there are any admissions uh, on this record uh, is very dangerous and highly prejudicial to the defendant. The only evidence the prosecution is pointing to are, are statements that they are going to argue are false. And because they are false, you can infer a consciousness of guilt. If they are true, they are exculpatory statements. They are not admissions. And they're trying to set up a double bind and say to the jury, regardless of whether you find these statements true or false, you can use them against the defendant. Use them as an admission if they're true. Use them as a false exculpatory statement if they're false. You can't have it both ways. They are not admissions. They are exculpatory statements. All right, we'll contemplate this one. All right, um, 8.30. And counsel, I'd, I'd like to hear the argument concerning whether the court should instruct on lesser included offenses, which would be second degree murder in this case. Uh, we are strongly opposed to this instruction, Your Honor, because uh, we believe there is simply no evidence on this record to support a conviction of second degree murder. The only thing we have uh, that can be offered by the people is speculation. Uh, speculation uh, which finds no, uh, no factual basis. Uh, and of course, the, the, the bedrock principle for the giving of a lesser included offense instruction uh, is that there is evidence to support uh, a, a verdict of a, of a lesser degree. The danger of this instruction uh, is in the face of a, a complete denial of uh, participation in the crime uh, and a consistent position asserted by the defense throughout these proceedings, uh, that he was not there, that he did not commit the crime. Uh, that position is substantially weakened by offering the jury an instruction that suggests that based on this evidence, they could find the defendant was there, but. Uh, had a state of mind that uh, required a reduction in the in the level of seriousness of the of the crime. Um, we rely on the Hardy case in which the California Supreme Court recognized that the court is not required to give the lesser included uh, instruction um, over the objection uh, of the defendant. Uh, uh, and the defendant uh, in this setting is willing to make a personal waiver on the record. Uh, to indicate that uh, he is personally opposed to the giving of this instruction uh, and that he waives any uh, objection to the failure of the court to instruct on a, on a lesser offense. The problem with this instruction is that without any evidentiary support, it invites the jury to compromise. Uh, it invites them if they are having doubts and difficulties uh, uh, in concluding that uh, there was a first degree murder here, uh, that they can compromise and return a, a verdict of second degree. Now, the willingness of the prosecution to accept that kind of compromise cannot bind the defendant. The defendant uh, continues uh, to assert his position 
that he is not guilty. Uh, if these uh, crimes were committed by another person, they, they are uh, premeditated uh, murders. Uh, and the, the defendant uh, uh, will not uh, uh, willingly accept a compromise verdict uh, that finds him guilty of, of second degree murder in the absence of any evidence in this record that this is a second degree murder. Mr. Gilbert. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I must confess, if the court will recall, I think the first time or second time maybe I had the privilege of coming down on this case to um, argue motions with the court. This came up in the context of the photograph admissibility question of uh, the coroner's photographs. And I think the court even asked me, well, am I obligated to give a voluntary manslaughter instruction? And I just gave some uh, casual response, but I think the bottom line was no, because there was no evidence that a reasonable person's passions and so forth would be raised. I did mention at that time the Wickersham case, 32 Cal 3rd, and I don't have the page number off uh, the top of my head, and I really, I didn't bring the materials. I did read the Hardy case after Mr. Uh, Ullman, Dean Ullman, raised it when I was down here that time. And if the court reads the Hardy case, it does not stand for the proposition that the court does not have a sua sponte duty to give a second degree lesser included murder instruction when in fact the evidence is sufficient to warrant second and not as a matter of law sufficient to only warrant first. Wickersham says that there is such a duty and the reason there's such a duty is very important. It doesn't matter what the defendant wants or doesn't want. What the courts are concerned about is jurors are presented evidence. They have to decide if it's a first degree murder by Dean Ullman's statement that he just made. What if they have doubts and uncertainties about it being first degree murder? If you give them only first degree murder or not guilty as the alternatives, those jurors, those jurors are faced with the following options. I believe this man is guilty of murder, of a heinous offense, but under the law that his honor has given us, I can't find beyond a reasonable doubt it was a premeditated, deliberate murder. What alternative do I have? Do I find him guilty of a murder in the first degree that I do not believe has been proved? Because I believe he committed some crime, even if not that one, but that's my only alternative that would find him guilty. Or do I find him not guilty, let a murderer go free because I followed my obligation under the law and applied that burden of proof to the premeditation deliberation element and found I couldn't find it beyond a reasonable doubt. Jurors are not to be put into that position. Jurors are here to render justice based upon the evidence. The defendant is not entitled to an acquittal where the evidence proves he committed a crime but not the full extent charged, nor is the defendant someone who should be penalized by being convicted of an offense higher than what the evidence shows because the jurors have been given only that option where they believe he is guilty of a serious crime, even if not that one. All right, well then let's examine what's in the record though. How do, how, what, what facts do you argue from that what? there is a possibility or there's something that would support a second but not a first or a first but not a second? Your Honor, let me point out, first of all, I'm not going to be down here arguing. That's the one thing I think I've tried to make clear to everybody um, in our uh, group of lawyers. I don't want to take away from what Ms. Clark may argue to this jury, and I don't have the full uh, opportunity of knowing all of the evidence. But let me start with just some obvious uh, aspects. Number one, the court always looks to evidence of planning, motive, and method of killing as evidence that suggests premeditation and deliberation. The Anderson criteria. Exactly, Your Honor. If one looks at Mr. Goldman's situation as to the manner of the killing, as to motive, as to planning, for him, one could see that a juror who is a reasonable juror may not be convinced even if we believe the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt, even if perhaps other jurors would find beyond a reasonable doubt that such evidence demonstrates premeditation and deliberation, but that Mr. Goldman, at the wrong place, at the wrong time, was the victim of 
a murder where there was not that careful weighing and consideration of the pros and cons of killing. The evidence, for example, that I assume is uh, inferential uh, to argue premeditation and deliberation, bringing the knife to the scene, bringing a ski cap to the scene, wearing gloves to the scene, and so forth, a jury may find, and I'm not suggesting that they should find, I'm merely indicating what they may find, that that is not sufficient beyond a reasonable doubt to convince them that the defendant carefully weighed the pros and cons of his actions. But rather, once there, without that kind of careful weighing, and in a moment of sheer anger and rage, killed these two people, murder in the second degree. That's the issue for this jury to decide. This court is well aware of all the evidence because this court has had to be here for every day of this trial. And I submit to the court that it is clear these are not, as a matter of law, remotely close to being murders in the first degree that the court can say as a matter of law. These are questions of fact for the jury. They have to look at evidence of planning. They have to look at evidence of motive. They have to look at the means of the executions of these two human beings. They have to look at what effect does rage and anger play in a person's ability to carefully weigh the pros and cons of that person's actions. This jury should not be placed with that Hobson's choice of either convicting this man of first degree where they don't believe that has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, but they know he's a murderer, or set this man free because the law says he's either a first degree murderer or you've got to set him free. They should not be placed in that position. This court's obligation is to see that these jurors can render the true and just verdicts in this case. And without that second degree murder, under these circumstances, they are not given that option, that benefit. They are forced into positions that the law does not require them to be forced into. May I have just a moment with Mr. Hodgman? Certainly. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Perlman, any brief response? Yes, Your Honor. The Wickersham case says that uh, the court should instruct on the lesser offense of second degree murder when the evidence raises a question as to whether all of the elements of the charged offense were present. When we look at the evidence of, uh, in this case as to how these murders were committed, there is not one shred of evidence that the people can point to suggesting that Ron Goldman was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. There is no evidence that suggests which of these victims or whether both of them were the target of the perpetrator of these murders. It's just as plausible on the evidence that the people have presented to suggest that Nicole Brown Simpson was in the wrong place at the wrong time when somebody came to murder Ron Goldman. There is no evidence in this record of any argument. There is no evidence of any uh, struggle uh, other than the, the struggle that immediately preceded the infliction of the, of the fatal wounds. The evidence that the people are going to rely on to suggest that this was a premeditated murder are, are the use of gloves and the bringing of a weapon to the crime scene. And those elements apply to, to both murders. Uh, and, and the position of the defendant is that, yes, these are premeditated murders that the defendant did not commit. Uh, and to speculate, uh, to speculate just on the basis not of the evidence, but of a tactical position that the prosecution chooses to assume, we contend prejudice is the defendant because the defendant's denial is undercut by the giving of that instruction. That instruction suggests to the jury an inconsistency in the defendant's position.
that he was not there, but perhaps if he was there, he didn't have the requisite state of mind. The defendant does not want the court to even suggest to the jury that if he was there, they can speculate on the state of mind he might have had uh, if, if he indeed was the perpetrator of this crime. So by giving that instruction, uh, you are contradicting and undercutting the defense presented by the defendant in this case. Uh, and we believe that under Hardy, uh, the court is clearly entitled, as the court said, the, the court need not deliver the instruction where a defendant expresses a deliberate tactical purpose for objecting to the instruction. We are expressing that purpose. Uh, we are objecting in the strongest possible terms because we believe the giving of this instruction will undercut the defense. All right. Thank you, counsel. Um, looking at the Anderson criteria, uh, the court uh, notes that the prosecution will likely argue that uh, going to a crime scene uh, at this time of year in Southern California wearing gloves, uh, taking what appears to be from the uh, uh, medical evidence a very strong, very sharp cutting instrument. Uh, having a uh, watch cap, which one could surmise is part of a uh, uh, means of concealment or clothing of concealment, um, the uh, colors of the threads that are found uh, indicating dark color clothing, uh, that this could be a classic uh, waiting, lying in wait, premeditated murder. Um, also looking at the physical evidence at the scene, the escape route going out the back, the bloody trail ending at a place where it would be logical to assume that somebody would park an automobile would uh, be argued by Ms. Clark probably an approach from the alley rather than from the street side. So there is a plausible from the record first degree argument that can be made from this evidence. Um, looking however at Ronald Goldman, I don't think there's any reasonable interpretation of the evidence that would not indicate that Mr. Goldman's presence at the uh, Bundy crime scene was by sheer chance, given his, uh, the testimony that we had that he had plans to meet another friend to uh, go dancing that night or go nightclubbing, and that he was dropping uh, uh, Judith Brown's glasses off at, the, uh, at Nicole Brown Simpson's residence, uh, surely as a uh, goodwill gesture by the uh, restaurant staff and his presence at the Bundy crime scene uh, was certainly not planned. Um, so th there is a, a uh, possibility, a, a plausible argument that can be made that he was not the original intended victim uh, in this killing and that his presence was, as Mr. Kelberg stated, wrong place, wrong time and that while there may be uh, physical evidence of a intent to kill from the nature of the uh, wounds that are inflicted, uh, there is insufficient showing, uh, or there may be an insufficient showing of uh, the requisite premeditation. Uh, so I will instruct on both first and second as a lesser included. All right. 8.83.2. Eight point eight three point two special circumstance, I believe. Yeah, just for the record that, that we were going to submit in addition eight point three one. Eight point three zero was in the original packet. That is second degree murder with express malice. Eight point three one defines second degree murder with implied malice. That'll be supplemented with our uh, materials this afternoon. All right, that's noted. All right, 8.83.2. There was a conflict between 8.83.2 and 17.42. We are withdrawing 8.83.2, Your Honor. All right.
All right, then that concludes our discussion of the defense objection to the instructions offered by the prosecution. John, could I also put on the record two things? Number one, I don't know if the court wanted to go over that uh, 2.13 instruction. You said when we finished this segment, I forget the court's wording. I don't know if you want to do that now. The other thing is I'm somewhat troubled by 1710, which was offered in the original packet. By your 1710? Our 1710. The original packet did not offer the Stone 8.75 instruction. Yes. And again, I, I don't know. Different people have different positions. Courts have different positions and so forth. But just 1710 is not exactly the best wording for a situation of where it's a single charge and the question is degree and then the question of the forms that go to the jury. So I just like to, on the record, keep open what might be the most appropriate instruction to the jury with respect to the number of uh, possible verdicts and so forth. And then maybe we can discuss that a little further this afternoon. The court's not as troubled as I am. No, I'm. I, anytime you say the stone instruction, I mean, any trial judge is clear, shudders at the mention of the stone instruction. All right. Well, we'll. We did not uh, discuss that in chambers, so we we will take that up. But let's let's finish what we have organized before us at this point. All right, defendants proposed jury instructions. The defense is proposing, in addition, uh, 2.11.5 unjoined co-conspirators. And Mr. Ullman, I'm referring to page three of your uh, request. Yes, sir. Um, our position is that there is evidence in the case indicating that a person uh, other than the defendant may have been involved in the crime, and this instruction simply uh, informs the jury that they should not consider uh, why that other person is not being prosecuted in this trial. We believe there is evidence uh, uh, from which the jury can uh, infer that uh, other persons were involved, uh, notably through the testimony of uh, Dr. Henry Lee with respect to other footprints uh, at, the, at the crime scene. So it is appropriate uh, for the jury to be instructed uh, with respect to the consideration of evidence of other persons involved. All right. Can you point to anything else on the record other than Dr. Lee's testimony concerning additional footprints? Yes. Um, evidence with respect to the of the wounds, uh, whether there were two knives used in the uh, infliction of the wounds. Um, I believe the, uh, there, is, there is evidence uh, with respect to uh, uh, Mr. Heitzker uh, that could be construed uh, to support the presence of, of two perpetrators as well, because Mr. Heitzker uh, testified to hearing uh, two voices, uh, and we don't uh, know with precision whether he was describing events preceding the murder or events immediately following the murder. That he heard two voices arguing and then he heard the clanging of the gates. Uh, we believe that would support the presence of two persons. We also have unidentified fingerprints uh, found at the scene that have not been associated either with the defendant uh, or any other identifiable person. Mr. Calvert? Your Honor, I think the intent of this instruction is pretty clearly understood. It is a situation where you have identified individuals, <coughs> but for the jury, there is perhaps only one defendant. So in a case with three obvious individuals involved, the liquor store robbery, three people go in, gunpoint, money taken, but this jury is asked to decide the guilt of a single individual the jury is not to speculate why we only have one person here for a crime which is clearly established to be one involving multiple people. This jury instruction would seem, in my judgment, to convey to the jury in much stronger terms than what even the best evidence the defense has just uh, indicated would support 
the possibility of a second person being involved. And it is not an appropriate instruction. It is uh, a situation that is well covered by 2.90 because our uh, responsibility is to prove that Mr. Simpson is a murderer of these two human beings beyond a reasonable doubt. If the defense wants to argue that because they believe the evidence shows there is a second killer, that that raises a reasonable doubt as to whether Mr. Simpson is involved at all, because if there are two, Mr. Simpson's not one of two, Mr. Simpson's not involved, two killers suggesting something other than Mr. Simpson, 2.11 2.11.5 is unnecessary. Its purpose is not needed in this situation. The defense is really raising an issue as to reasonable doubt of identity of Mr. Simpson based upon a contention that there were multiple killers. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? If you look at uh, 2.11.5's 89 revision, the second paragraph, there may be many reasons why such person is not here on trial. Therefore, do not discuss or give any consideration as to why the other person is not being prosecuted in this trial, or whether he or she has been or will be prosecuted. Your sole duty is to decide whether the people have proved the guilt of the defendant on trial or defendants on trial. I think it's clear from that paragraph, Your Honor, and by the way, that is not a bracketed paragraph. That is not one that is uh, apply only if applicable. I think that clearly indicates the purpose behind this instruction, and this case does not fit within that criteria. How do you address the, the evidence, however, that uh, Dean Ullman has raised, the Dr. Lee's testimony that there may have been second other footprints there, the fact that we do have unidentified fingerprints that cannot be made to anybody uh, that we know of, and uh, the what? testimony by... Uh, both pathologists that two knives cannot be ruled out. It seems to me that the defense wouldn't want an instruction like this. It seems to me the defense wants to have the jury constantly thinking about two killers, but two killers in the sense of by reason of there being two killers, it tells you Mr. Simpson is not one of the two killers. He is not a killer by nature of the fact that these people were killed by multiple people. That's really what they're trying to focus on, not, hey, you can't consider what these other people uh, are facing in this case because you're solely to decide Mr. Simpson. They want the jury to focus on that there are these other people because that raises, in their judgment, a reasonable doubt as to his guilt. This instruction really undercuts what it is they want to argue from there being evidence of a second killer. All right, are you familiar with the, the Farmer case and the use of... 47 Cal 3rd? Yes. Um, I know it in some aspects, but as to this particular instruction, I am not. I know it has spontaneous utterance issues and other things. Your Honor, we have no objection to giving the, the revision in the CalJet uh, supplement to 211.5. In fact, uh, we find that uh, it is actually a better instruction for our purposes. Uh, and our purposes uh, are clearly identified uh, uh, by Mr. Kelbert. That is, uh, we certainly are going to suggest to the jury that there were two killers, but that's all the more reason for the jury not to speculate about the reasons why this other person uh, is not here on trial. The, the point of this instruction uh, is that you should not, uh, for example, conclude that uh, <coughs> Perhaps there wasn't another such person because that person isn't here on trial. That ordinarily both of the people uh, who committed a murder would both be on trial, and the fact that, that this other person isn't on trial uh, leads to some sort of inference that this other person doesn't exist. That's precisely the prejudice and the inference that, uh, that we want to avoid and that we're entitled to avoid by the giving of this instruction to say to the jury, don't even worry or think about why that other person isn't here on trial. But that doesn't say don't consider or think about the possibility that there was another person involved in the commission of this crime. All right. Thank you, counsel. Let me read the Farmer case because it's cited in the use notes. Your Honor, may I have an opportunity to read it as well and offer if I have any comments on that? Yes. All right. 260, 260.1. No objection. 
no objection. 3.31, I think we've agreed that how that's going to be modified. All right, 4.50 alibi. Yes, Your Honor invited us to uh, consider how uh, 450, the CalGIF instruction on alibi, might be modified. Um, and I would invite the court's attention to uh, special instructions D31 and D32, which I think address uh, much more specifically the defendant's uh, theory of the, of the case. Uh, and uh, uh, clear up the uh, issue that uh, we, we previously identified with respect to the ambiguity of 450 in the context of this case. Uh, these special instructions uh, uh, make it clear that the defendant does not have any obligation uh, to offer evidence that uh, he was not present at the time and place of, of the commission of the crime, um, and that uh, uh, if the evidence raises a reasonable doubt uh, whether he was present, then he's entitled to, uh, to an acquittal, and the burden remains on the prosecution to prove that, uh, that he was present. And sec uh, Special Instruction D32 uh, instructs the jury how to consider uh, the evidence that may raise a reasonable doubt uh, whether the defendant uh, was present, making it clear that he doesn't have to show he was somewhere else at a specific time uh, that, the, that the crime was committed. Uh, we believe that uh, the defendant is uh, definitely entitled to an instruction with respect to the, the uh, alibi defense, which is the, really the theory of the, uh, uh, of the defendant's uh, defense, and the, and the defendant is entitled uh, to an instruction that uh, conveys to the jury how it should consider the, the evidence presented uh, by the defense in this respect. Uh, we believe that all of the evidence uh, does raise a reasonable doubt whether the defendant was present uh, at the time and place that the, that the crime was committed, and the jury needs to be instructed that the defendant does not bear the burden of proof with respect to this evidence, that all they need is a reasonable doubt, and that uh, considering all of the evidence, uh, uh, such a reasonable doubt would require an acquittal. Right. Your Honor, uh, with respect to 4.50, and based upon, I think, the court's recommendation or concerns as expressed during our informal conference, if the court wishes to modify the first phrasing of that instruction, and instead of what it presently says in the uh, pattern instruction, say that evidence has either been received or been introduced uh, for the purpose of, we will have no objection to that. As it is phrased, we think it is misleading, uh, even if not technically erroneous or in error under the law, it is very misleading to a lay jury. With respect to D31 and D32, uh, I invite the court's attention to People's Special Instruction Number 2, which says the prosecution has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt each element of the crimes charged in the information and that the defendant was a perpetrator of any such charged crime. Between uh, 4.50 and our Special Instruction Number 2, the defendant is getting every benefit of what he is entitled to receive. That is, the jury has a clear understanding that there are two issues the prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt, and the elements of the offense is just one, are just one of the issues that we have to uh, prove. We must prove identity as well. What counsel's proposed instructions are, D32 is clearly argumentative and focusing on specific facts. These are uh, so-called SEERS, S-E-A-R-S, type instructions, but actually if the court looks at People v. Garceau, G-A-R-C-E-A-U, 6 Cal 4th, 140, starting at page 191, the court will note, uh, actually from page 192, how in People v. Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, the Supreme Court rejected a special instruction that similarly pinpointed specific evidence rather than a particular theory of the defendant's case. 
such an instruction properly is refused as argumentative because it would invite the jury to draw inferences favorable to the defendant from specified items of evidence on a disputed question of fact and therefore properly belongs not in instructions but in arguments of counsel to the jury. Uh, defendant, the special instruction of the defendant in Garceau could be read to embrace stated principles of law involving reasonable doubt. And if so, it was repetitious of other instructions given, notably 2.90, which this court has recognized as the best available definition of the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It uh, goes on in Garceau in dealing with another special instruction offered um, to find that the trial court properly excluded this special instruction, which selected certain evidence and implied the weight to be deprived therefrom, thus creating the same type of argumentative instruction disapproved in right. The instruction was also repetition of, repetitious of the standard cautionary instructions given to the jury. In this case, it was 2.70 and 2.71.7, and therefore properly refused. The Supreme Court in Freeman, F-R-E-E-M-A-N, and I have a citation around here somewhere, if I can uh, dig through my pile, let's see. Uh, 8 Cal 4, 450, page 504, and the court's well aware, I think, of the Freeman case and the moral certainty uh, language. But it makes note on 504 that um, although modifying the standard instruction is perilous, they do, in this limited instance, suggest a modification. They then go on to say, making these changes and no others would avoid both, the, uh, both avoid the perils that have caused appellate courts to caution trial courts against modifying the standard instruction and satisfy the concerns the high court has expressed regarding that instruction. And as the court is well aware, the legislature and urgency legislation just passed on, I'm trying to get the date, uh, our memo came down August 31, 95. It became effective July 3rd, 1995. The new 1096 <coughs> language, which is in conformity with what was the modified CALGIC 2.90 following the Victor versus Nebraska, Sandoval versus California decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court. But what's important to also note is 1096A, which says, in charging a jury, the court may read to the jury section 1096 and no further instruction on the subject of the presumption of innocence or defining reasonable doubt need be given. So taking into uh, consideration all the case law that I've discussed, the uh, legislative uh, changes and intent behind 1096A, and the fact that uh, counsel's statements are either argumentative or covered by what we agree should be given, 4.50 as modified, and um, the uh, special instruction number two about our burden of proof on identity, 31 and 32 should be refused. Thank you. All right. Your Honor, the, the prosecution uh, is asserting a position that has been specifically rejected again and again uh, by the courts of California that with respect to the defendant's theory of the case, all you have to do is give a reasonable doubt instruction. The law clearly is, and we cite People versus Williams as support for our special instruction number 32. Upon request, the court is required to give any correct <coughs> instruction on the defendant's theory of the case, which the evidence justifies, no matter how weak or unconvincing that evidence may be. Special instruction number D32 is an instruction that uh, specifically uh, tells the jury what to do with the defendant's theory of the case. The defendant's theory of the case uh, is that he did not have sufficient time or opportunity to commit this crime. And the jury needs to know that the defendant does not bear the burden of proof on that issue. He doesn't have to prove to them that he didn't have sufficient time or opportunity to commit the crime. But if they simply have a reasonable doubt of whether he had sufficient time and opportunity to commit this crime, then he is entitled to an acquittal. And quite clearly, that's all that uh, instruction number 32 says. We believe we are entitled to this instruction uh, because this is the defendant's theory of the case and the evidence justifies this instruction. All right. Thank you, Counsel.
All right. I, I agree that the uh, defendant's entitled to the uh, alibi instruction. I will give 4.50 as requested, however modified, uh, to address the concerns that we discussed in chambers given the first section, first phrase of that instruction. The instruction that the court will give will read as follows. Evidence has been received for the purpose of showing that the defendant was not present at the time and place of the commission of the alleged crime for which he is on trial. If after consideration of all the evidence you have a reasonable doubt that the defendant was present at the time the crime was committed, you must find him not guilty. The court will give that instruction as modified. All right, I believe that that concludes our discussion of the additional Calgic instructions. Yes, I'm not going to give 31 and 32. All right, and we need to now address the special instructions that the defendant has offered, D1 through 32. And, counsel, we're going to take a 10-minute break at this point. Yes, for your uh, planning purposes, uh, we will be dark on Monday the 25th at the request of the uh, parties and the Goldman family. Um, however, my staff will be here uh, Monday to assist with any organization of exhibits or anything that you need for the preparation of your argument. So that, that we will be available to accommodate you on that. All right, let's go to Defense Special Instruction number D1, starting at page 5. I don't know if this is the appropriate time. I had a chance to read the Farmer case. And I don't know if you want my... Okay. We'll save it. Save it. Okay. All right, let's start with D1. And actually, we have D1 through D5, D5 or of a similar vein. And also people's uh, special number one, Your Honor. Calvert. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I mentioned in our informal discussions, um, first of all, the Everett case, Everett versus Everett, 150 Cal F 3rd, 1053, 1072 and 73, and footnote 18, which discusses this issue of the 403C jury instruction. Uh, and I think it's interesting in that case to note in the uh, footnoted uh, material, in discussing this issue of the judge making a preliminary foundation finding on a relevancy issue and so forth, that um, the court finds, not the court, the assembly committee on the judiciary's comments finds that frequently the jury's duty to disregard conditionally admissible evidence when it is not persuaded of the existence of the preliminary fact on which relevancy is conditioned is so clear that an in, uh, instruction to this effect is unnecessary. For example, if the disputed preliminary fact is the authenticity of a deed, it hardly seems necessary to instruct the jury to disregard the deed if it should find that the deed is not genuine. No rational jury could find the deed to be spurious and yet to be still effective to transfer title from the pur uh, purported grantor. They go on in this commentary from the assemb uh, Assembly Committee to point out, at times, however, it is not quite so clear that the conditionally admissible evidence should be disregarded unless the preliminary fact is found to exist. In such cases, the jury should be appropriately instructed. For example, the theory upon which agents and co-conspirator statements are admissible is that the party is vicariously responsible for the acts and statements of agents and co-conspirators within the scope of the agency or conspiracy. Yet it is not always clear that statements made by a purported agent or co-conspirator should be disregarded if not made in furtherance of the agency or conspiracy. Hence, the jury should be instructed to disregard such statements unless it is persuaded that the statements were made within the scope of the agency or conspiracy. And then they go on to note that subdivision C therefore permits the judge in any case 
to instruct the jury to disregard conditionally admissible evidence unless it is persuaded of the existence of the preliminary fact. Further, subdivision C requires the judge to give such an instruction whenever he is requested by a party to do so. There is no doubt, based on 403C, that this court has an obligation because the defense is requesting through D1 through D5 uh, to have the jury instructed on these foundational aspects of relevancy for this physical evidence. But I think it's important, number one, just to understand that first comment about sometimes it's so obvious that unless, of course, the instruction must be given because there's a request, there's no reason to give it. The whole thrust of this defense case is disregard the physical evidence because its sources are so spurious as to show clearly that any result you would take from that evidence and infer that O.J. Simpson is the killer is unreliable. If it is not clear to this jury by now that there is a contention from the defense that this evidence that we contend is a mountain of evidence to prove the defendant's guilt is merely irrelevant evidence because it lacks chain of custody, it's contaminated, it's confused, it's planted, who knows what. But it is not evidence which was deposited by the killer or in some fashion created in the course of the killings from which it is rational for the jury to infer that such evidence proves identity. That's what this all comes down to. I don't think this is a real tough thing for the jury to figure out as to if you believe the defense that there's problems with all this stuff, it's not very good evidence. And if you believe the prosecution that this stuff is a mountain of evidence, Mr. Simpson's going to be in some trouble. The judge, the judge has to instruct under 403C. That's what our proposed instruction does. And what it tells the jury in neutral terms, legal terms, not isolating on specific evidence, not being argumentative, not being inaccurate and misleading as the evidence, uh, as the um, references to the evidence in D1 through D5 are, is that where there is physical evidence admitted, including the expert opinions concerning analysis of such evidence, that evidence may have a tendency and reason. Notice the word may. May have a tendency and reason to prove elements of the crimes charged or the identity of a perpetrator of such crimes or both. You, this instruction then tells the jury, you are the sole judges of whether such evidence does in fact have a tendency and reason to prove any issue in this case. They are the sole judges of whether this evidence is relevant. The instruction then tells them what they need to know in order to decide if this evidence is relevant by saying, if after your review and consideration of all of the circumstances surrounding any specific item of physical evidence or expert opinion, you find that such evidence does not have a tendency and reason to prove any <coughs> element of the crimes charged or the identity of a perpetrator of the crimes charged. You are instructed to disregard such evidence as such a finding renders this evidence irrelevant. If this jury finds that the chain of custody is so botched that one can't say that what was tested was the same item that was recovered, if this jury believes that something flew in the air and in fact contaminated some stain such that what the result was was the result of what flew in the air and not what was in the stain originally, this jury will know from a review of all the circumstances that that evidence will have no tendency and reason to prove that Mr. Simpson's the killer. I don't think, logically, it takes an instruction to tell the jury what is so reasonable for any juror to understand and which will, I'm sure, be mentioned more than once or twice in the defense arguments to this jury. But this instruction gives the defense everything which legally they are entitled to in a fashion which is a legally correct statement of law which is neutral, neutral to both sides. May I have just a moment, Your Honor? Mr. Clark wants me to be sure, if I didn't uh, mention in uh, enough detail, that 
the instructions themselves, even if the court were inclined to think that there is something broader that is required, they are argumentative and inaccurate. There are so many misstatements. For example, Mr. Clark points out that um, a stain going from a wet state to a dry state, that's a change, which under some of these instructions would suggest that the result is unreliable and not relevant. Or a number of changes in the sense of bacteria getting into the mix, that's contamination. But that doesn't mean that the end result of whatever DNA testing is performed is unreliable or invalid. And so, again, these are issues of fact for the jury to decide with proper legal instructions. The instructions proposed by the defense are arguments to the jury that are incomplete and misleading. And more fundamentally, they are not a correct statement of law for the purposes of helping this jury neutrally assess the evidence. Submitted, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. The people's proposed special instruction number one completely misconstrues the whole purpose of section 403 of the evidence code. What this instruction does is say to the jury, if you find the evidence is irrelevant, disregard it. And it, it states that test in terms of the legal test of relevance. If you find the evidence does not have any tendency and reason to prove any element of the crimes charged. That's a determination made by the court in admitting or rejecting evidence. You find it's relevant, it's admitted, the jury then considers it. And we don't tell the jury, while well, you review the judge's rulings on whether this evidence was relevant, and if you disagree with the judge, then don't consider the evidence. That's not the, the purpose of uh, section 403 of the evidence code. Section 403 of the evidence code does not invite the jury to redetermine the question of relevance. It invites the jury to make a finding on a preliminary or foundational fact. The relevance of the evidence uh, is dependent upon. And there's a very, I, I know my students have great difficulty understanding the difference between 403 and 405 and, and understanding what uh, preliminary facts are. And apparently, Mr. Kelberg has the same problem. So let, let me see if I can educate uh, him a little bit. A preliminary fact is defined in the evidence code in section 400 as a fact upon the existence or non-existence of which depends the admissibility or inadmissibility of evidence. A preliminary fact, for example, relevant to much of this evidence is that there was a proper chain of custody maintained, that the evidence was maintained in an unaltered or unchanged uh, condition from the time it was seized until the time it was, uh, it was examined. Now, what section 403 says is that where the relevance of the evidence depends on the existence of a preliminary fact, the court must find that that preliminary fact, uh, there's sufficient evidence to support a finding of that preliminary fact, and then submit to the jury the determination of whether they find the preliminary fact exists, and if they find it exists, to then consider the evidence itself. And section 403 says that with respect to these kinds of preliminary facts, not all preliminary facts, there are preliminary facts as to which the finding of the court is conclusive and determinative, and we don't then hand to the jury uh, the determination, for example, of whether uh, a privilege exists. Uh, but with respect to a preliminary fact on which the, the relevance of the evidence depends, we do hand that issue to the jury. And 403 says, the court on request shall instruct the jury to determine whether the preliminary fact exists and to disregard the evidence if they find it does not exist. That's not a determination of relevance. It is a determination of a fact upon which relevance depends. And the instruction submitted by the people invites the jury to redetermine relevance without identifying for them 
the specific preliminary fact that they have to find before the evidence becomes relevant. And what we have done in uh, proposed instructions D1 through D5 is to identify what the preliminary fact is that they have to find before that evidence is relevant and may be considered by them. How do you address Mr. Kelberg's uh, concern that these instructions relate to specific items of evidence and are phrased in an argumentative manner? Well, they, they have to relate to specific items of evidence because each of these specific items of evidence is admitted under Section 403 of the Evidence Code. I mean, these are specific items of evidence where their relevance depends on the finding of a preliminary fact. And there's no other way to present it to the jury other than to identify what that preliminary fact is that they must find before they can consider, for example, evidence of blood or hairs or fibers. They have to find that a reasonable chain of custody was maintained with respect to that evidence. Uh, otherwise, it's irrelevant. Uh, so this simply informs them that you've got to make that finding before you consider this evidence for any other purpose. Uh, with respect to specific uh, deposits of blood, those deposits are irrelevant if they were deposited at some time other than the commission of the crime by some person other than the perpetrator of the crime. And this tells them, unless you find that, disregard it. It's irrelevant. So that there's simply no other way to present a 403 question to the jury other than to identify the specific item of evidence and tell them what preliminary fact they must find before they consider that evidence. Very briefly. Um, I think the fact that Dean Ullman views 403C one way and the fact that I may view it differently uh, should not be taken as anything unusual in the practice of law. Perhaps my students are uh, given my point of view, Dean Ullman's students are given his point of view, and that's why we perpetuate uh, why we have five to four decisions from the United States Supreme Court. Very hard for lawyers to agree on much of anything. But for example, in uh, instruction D1, if you determine that a reasonable chain of custody of such evidence was not established, however, you must disregard such evidence and not consider it for any purpose. Your Honor, the jurors could find that there were things about the chain of custody that were not reasonable, yet it did not impact at all on the integrity of the evidence. And as a result, whatever result that was obtained from a testing of that evidence is in fact evidence which is a uh, rational source for inferring the identity of the defendant as the perpetrator. That's why these instructions are very misleading factually and legally. And where the real issue is, the jury must look and find for themselves from the underlying circumstances that go to the issue of whether the evidence is relevant, whether in fact from that review of all of those circumstances, they believe the evidence has a tendency and reason to prove one of these issues. If they find from the review of all the circumstances that go to issues like chain of custody and so forth, that this evidence has lost its integrity of showing what it is claimed to show. The jury is told you cannot consider it because having decided that foundational fact against the prosecution, you have found this evidence to be irrelevant and having made that finding, you may not consider it. That's what our proposed instruction says. That is what the law requires, I submit. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. All right, the court will decline to give one through five. I will give a modification of people's one. All right, special instruction D6, match in fibers and hairs. <coughs> Mr. Kelberg. On D6, Your Honor, number one, of course, uh, 2.80, the standard jury instruction tells the jury exactly how they are to assess expert testimony. This instruction focuses on a very narrow area of the physical evidence, 
and attempts to uh, highlight that evidence and the jury's understanding of what they can do with this evidence. Even though I haven't heard a lot of the testimony in this area, it uh, appears not only from what I have heard, but from our informal conversations in chambers, that if the jury understands very little else about this case, they understand the limited nature of comparisons of hair and fiber and the difference between the power of comparisons of hair and fiber to the power of RFLP DNA testing. This instruction is unnecessary. It focuses on a narrow area. It is covered by 2.80, and I submit the court should reject it and give the standard instruction. Thank you. One word that has recurred with some frequency throughout this, well, there are lots of words that have recurred with some frequency, but one that uh, can certainly lead to some confusion on the part of the jury uh, is the word match. Uh, with respect to some testimony, uh, the, the witnesses uh, were instructed not to use the word, and despite that instruction, the word crept in uh, again and again. Uh, we're gonna hear that word in closing argument. Uh, and the jury, needs to know that with respect to some evidence, that word can be used and it has a specific meaning, and with respect to other evidence, that word cannot be used. Uh, and they need to know why. And this instruction simply tells them that we did not use the word match with respect to hairs and fibers, and here is why. Because an opinion that they have similar characteristics is not a match. It does not mean that they, that they came from the same source. Uh, and we believe it's appropriate to make that distinction because we made it in the presentation of the evidence. We're going to make it again in the closing argument. And the jury should be let in on the secret as to why some evidence can be characterized as a match, some cannot, and what the word match means. Thank you, counsel. All right. In this situation, the question is whether or not the court feels it's appropriate uh, to give the uh, jury guidance in this area, whether or not they need guidance here, and whether or not there's any danger that they'll be misled from the manner in which the evidence was presented. Um, the evidence presented with regards to both hair and fibers uh, was very clear to the jury, um, and the limitations uh, with regard to that evidence as to both hair and fibers was apparent to the jurors through both direct and cross-examination. I don't think this instruction is necessary and I decline to give it. All right, D7. Your Honor, I believe based upon our conversations in chamber, chambers, if we uh, join D7 and our proposed special jury instruction number three, although I believe, Your Honor, we would like to work a little bit on the language. Um, so I think it's best if the court might reserve the issue here. We will definitely, um, based upon the court's uh, discussion with us, coordinate by having the first sentence of um, our proposed special jury instruction followed by some form of the second sentence of the defendant's proposed D7, and then followed by some form of the third sentence of the, or the next sentence of the defendant's proposed, and concluding with the second sentence of our proposed number three instruction. But we would submit this early this afternoon, Your Honor. Your Honor, we believe that uh, the special instruction number D7 is absolutely essential to a proper evaluation by the jury of the, of the DNA evidence. Uh, Your Honor has already indicated uh, that, that you would give the second and third sentences, which we believe are uh, absolutely essential in terms of the meaning of a random match. Uh, but it is also essential that the jury know that the uh, statistics presented with respect to matches uh, make no uh, accommodation of the possibility of contamination or errors in laboratory analysis. Uh, and we believe that uh, it is appropriate to so inform the jury that the probability statistics uh, assume 
that there has not been contamination, there has not been error uh, in the laboratory uh, analysis. Um, informed uh, uh, by Mr. Sheck that the, the importance of the laboratory error rates uh, is so essential that uh, the report of the National Academy of Science uh, recommends that in every case the jury be told about the significance of, uh, of laboratory error rates and that uh, Your Honor had indicated that, uh, that the jury would be so instructed. In the, in the final instructions, but we, we can't... I don't know that I said that. I think I said that I would allow the admission of evidence going to laboratory error rate. That was my recollection, but in any event, go ahead. Well, we, we, we uh, would, would strongly urge that the court, again, look at the recommendations of the National Academy of Science uh, in terms of, of not only what evidence is admissible, but what the jury is told about the significance of that evidence, that it is absolutely essential that they understand that these random match uh, probabilities take no account or, or do not uh, in any way uh, take into consideration uh, the, the possibility of, uh, of laboratory error rates uh, or the possibility of contamination. Uh, first of all, Mr. Clark assures me that the modifications, if any, to the second and third sentences will be minimal. We do clearly object to the last sentence of D7. Why? Because, number one, the jury has been informed through questioning of Dr. Gerdes, through the uh, error rates at Cellmark evidence and so forth, about those circumstances and about what influence, if any, those circumstances play on statistics. This is argument. This is a defense argument. Also, contamination does not mean that the statistics are unreliable for use in assessing a match because as the court has heard, as this jury has heard, samples can be contaminated and yield reliable and valid results. So it is not an accurate statement of fact. It is a defense argument to the jury as to what they should conclude from evidence they have already heard and which they can assess for themselves as to the significance of the laboratory error rates and the uh, possible impact of contamination. So then. Your Honor, we're dealing with evidence uh, that the appellate courts again and again have expressed grave reservations and caution about the misuse of this evidence, the potential that juries can be misled uh, as to the significance of, of DNA evidence. Uh, and we believe that the, the recommendations of the National Academy of, of Science should be given great weight uh, in terms of how this evidence is, is presented to a jury because of that tremendous risk that the jury will uh, make assumptions about uh, what, what this evidence says to them uh, and what it doesn't say. And, and one thing that this evidence clearly does not say uh, is that uh, you, can, you can assume that the, the evidence is not contaminated and you can assume that there were no errors made uh, in the laboratory analysis. Uh, and, and we believe it is essential that the jury be told the significance of a match uh, takes no account, takes no measure uh, in, in, with respect to that possibility uh, that these statistics assume that there has been no contamination, it assumes there has been no uh, laboratory error, uh, and the jury must be informed of that fact.
respect to uh, Mr. Kelberg's argument uh, that results may be valid even in the presence of, uh, of contamination, that is a qualifier that, that can be added, uh, depending on the kind of contamination that we're dealing with. But the laboratory error rates are absolutely essential. I mean, the National Academy of Sciences uh, position is that random match statistics uh, are, are meaningless. But the NRC report says that jurors should be made aware of laboratory error rates, and that's what's occurred here. I mean, they've been told about the laboratory error no, rates. No, they have to be made aware that these statistics, that uh, the, the random match statistics, do not take into account the possibility of laboratory error rates. Uh, that's what they need to be told, that, that, that these statistics um, assume that there has been no error in the, uh, the laboratory analysis. But ha wasn't that brought out before the jury during both the direct and cross-examination, well, so, so for example, the, of Dr. Weir? So was the significance of the, of the random match. Mm -hmm. But the point is, uh, at, at the, the instruction phase, when we're telling the jury as a matter of law what this evidence means, the risk of misuse of this evidence is so great that the, the jury must be told in unequivocal terms a random match uh, does not mean uh, that, that we're assessing the, the uh, probable guilt of the defendant, and a random match assumes that there has not been an error in the laboratory analysis. All right. Thank you, counsel. Uh, no, I think I've heard enough on this. Thank you. All right. The court will instruct as follows as to this issue. You have heard testimony about frequency estimated excuse me, frequency estimates calculated for matches between known reference blood samples and some of the blood stain evidence items in this case. The random match probability statistic used by DNA experts is not the equivalent of a statistic that tells you the likelihood whether a defendant committed the crime. The random match probability statistic is the likelihood that a random person in the population would match the characteristics that were found in the crime scene evidence and in the reference sample. And that will be the instruction. I'm sorry. I left that out. These frequency estimates are being presented for the limited purpose of assisting you in determining what significance to attach to those blood stain testing results. I will prepare the uh, modified instruction. All right, we'll stand in recess 1:30. All right, back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter. All right, let's go to D9. Your Honor, if uh, we could just uh, ask the court to consider one very brief and very straightforward addition to uh, the combination of D7 and D3 that uh, Your Honor indicated to the court. Our concern is that uh, there is a potential here to seriously mislead the jury by telling them that uh, frequency <coughs> estimates are presented in order to assess what significance uh, could be attached to testing results uh, when the, the same results could also be explained by, by laboratory error. And uh, we would ask the court to simply add uh, a sentence that comes straight out of the National Research Council report uh, to tell the jury that frequency estimates and laboratory error are different phenomena and both should be considered in determining what significance to attach to blood stain testing results. Uh, we believe that that, that cautionary note is, uh, is justified uh, by the NRC report and is certainly justified by the evidence in this case 
uh, and will avoid misleading the jury that only frequency estimates are uh, relevant in assessing the weight that they should give to testing results. Any additional comment in response? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Clark, who is much more familiar with the contents of the NRC report, uh, tells me that there were a number of recommendations made in the NRC report, only one of which appears to be the focus of this jury instruction, one of which was jurors should be selected based on their familiarity with DNA. And so the fact that the defense wants to highlight a recommendation and take it into the form of a jury instruction, when in fact there is nothing within the contents of the NRC report which says that that is in fact required. What's in fact required is that the jury be apprised, as they have been through the course of testimony, uh, is inappropriate. It singles out one particular aspect. And laboratory error, Your Honor, applies to any scientific evidence. I was thinking in an area that I did have some um, involvement with the coroner's testimony. There were lab tests run for blood alcohol and drug content on uh, specimens from the two decedents. Laboratory error can apply to the accuracy of the finding. Laboratory error can apply to the finding of, as I recall, 0.02 uh, for the blood alcohol of Nicole Brown Simpson. To isolate this and bring it into the form of a jury instruction highlighting to the jury one factual issue on which the jury has been fully apprised is inappropriate. Uh, and, Your Honor, if the court wants to see, if the court has not, we prepared the modified instruction that the court wished. Uh, and I have it here if the court wants to take a look at it to see it in its final form. All right. May I approach? No, I, yeah, please. And you've given a copy to counsel. I have. And right. I've also attached the other instructions that we were going to provide the court. Thank you. And I have given counsel. One brief response, and, and uh, we'll submit this matter, Your Honor. But the, the risk of isolating uh, one explanation is a risk that arises from the present instruction that the court proposes to give by just saying that frequency estimates should be considered. These, these are estimates that range in the one in a billion uh, uh, <coughs> phenomenon. And uh, to, to say to the jury, consider that uh, in, in, in assessing what significance you should give to this, these, these results without, at, at the same time, offering the alternative uh, explanation uh, of, of the possibility of laboratory error is highly misleading. And uh, the, the, the very fact that jurors are not acquainted with DNA technology, that they haven't been pre-screened because they understand these phenomena, simply undermines the importance of not misleading them. And uh, that's precisely the point that the NRC report is making, and that's a report, a, a, a point of view that uh, we think is very important for this jury to hear. All right, Mr. Mr. Ullman, the, one of the problems I'm having, though, is that, one, the NRC is a scientific document not written by lawyers or judges and does not address specifically the issue of jury instructions. The case that you cite to me, State versus Bloom, uh, Justice Page's concurring opinion, does include a jury instruction, which does not include the language that you're asking for. So, I mean, it, unless you, is there any case that you can cite to me where there's an, been an appellate court approving the instruction that you're seeking? Because what you've cited to me here does not support the instruction you request. Um, I believe Mr. Sheck uh, can provide some additional citations. Uh, but All right. At this point, counsel, if, if you have something else you want to submit to the court, fine. But at this point, um, based upon what's been presented to me, that's the instruction I'm going to give. All right. Let's move on to we'll, D9. We'll make an additional submission, Your Honor. But uh, we, we believe the NRC report is, is really addressing the question of what use of this science should be made uh, in the courtroom. And uh, the whole point of the report uh, is to highlight the dangers 
that are presented uh, when, when jurors are asked to assess this kind of evidence. And we believe one of those dangers is simply to focus on, on one half of the equation and not on the other. All right. D9. Your Honor, the people's objection to D9 is uh, multifaceted. Number one, of course, we start with Calgic 2.11 regarding the uh, lack of necessity for either side to call all witnesses. D9 is focusing on the prosecution and only the prosecution without citation, of course, to a well-known line of cases uh, arising from Vargas, People versus Vargas, B-A-R-G-A-S, 9 Cal 3rd, dealing with the right of the prosecution to talk to the jury about the failure of the defense to call logical or material witnesses, of course, other than the defendant, uh, when such evidence uh, should or was available to the defense. We feel that the appropriate instruction to give in this area is the, uh, the proposed defense instruction D10, to which we do not object, and then the right of counsel for the defense and the prosecution to argue to the jury the failure of one side or the other to produce what each side perceives to be logical or material witnesses that the other side didn't perceive and for the jury to draw the unfavorable inference that that side arguing the position wishes the jury to draw. That's where it should be. D10 is an uh, accurate statement of law. D9 is not. It is slanted. It is one-sided. It is inappropriate. Your Honor, there's a reason why this is one-sided, and that is simply that the prosecution has the burden of proof. Uh, it cannot be said that the defense might be expected to produce a witness because the defense has no obligation to present any evidence or witnesses. Uh, this uh, instruction is motivated uh, primarily by the failure of the prosecution to call the coroner. Uh, how many murder cases uh, has Your Honor ever heard of in which the coroner who conducted the autopsy uh, was not called as a witness, but instead uh, another uh, medical examiner was brought in uh, to describe the results of the autopsy. Uh, and we believe that... Uh, when the coroner uh, was still available. And the coroner was available. Absolutely. No, we, we had a, a situation here in Los Angeles County where a very hard-working deputy medical examiner died and there were dozens of murder cases that involved his testimony that other people had to come in and testify to. So it's not an unusual phenomenon when the person's not and, available. And I'm sure when they called another uh, medical examiner in, the jury was told that the, mm -hmm. the initial coroner had died. Uh, but here we have a situation where uh, it, it is fair to say the prosecution, which has the burden of proof in this case, uh, might be expected to produce the coroner who conducted the autopsy. Their failure to do so uh, uh, justifies an inference that the testimony would have been unfavorable to the prosecution. I mean, excuse me, just a second. Um, Dean Allman, what's your posture on D10? as it relates to, I mean, see, what is your position as to D10 standing by itself? Our, our fear of D10 standing by itself is the fear that um, it will turn around to sting us uh, for reasons that are beyond our control. D10 says that if a party offers weaker and less satisfactory evidence, uh, when it is within their power to produce stronger and more satisfactory evidence, the evidence should be viewed with distrust. Uh, now that's fine as far as it goes, uh, as long as the jury knows uh, what stronger and more powerful evidence uh, a party has the power to produce. The one setting in which uh, we were unable to produce stronger and more powerful evidence and had to produce weaker and less satisfactory evidence related to the testimony of Laura McKinney, uh, where we had to simply summarize the contents of transcripts and tape recordings when the jury was aware 
of the existence of those transcripts and tape recordings, and no explanation was offered to them as to why those transcripts and tape recordings were not produced in court. And of course, the reason they were not produced is because the court ruled that they were inadmissible. That's all we want the jury to know, that they didn't hear those, trans or those tapes, they didn't see those transcripts, because the court ruled they were inadmissible. With that caution, uh, Special Instruction D-10 is a perfectly appropriate uh, instruction that we do want given to tell the jury that if a party has the power to produce stronger and more powerful evidence, and they produce weaker and less satisfactory evidence, then that evidence should be viewed with distrust. May I briefly respond, Your Honor? Um, even though whoever will be arguing this case to the jury is not down here, I feel absolutely comfortable in telling this uh, court that there will be no argument made that D-10 should be applied to the failure of the defense to produce more than was produced from the McKinney tape transcript available source or sources. That is not going to be the application of this instruction. What is going to be the application of this instruction will involve why Dr. Readers, for example, was called to talk about Mr. Martz's results rather than bring in the man or the woman who obtained the stains from the various samples that were collected from the gate and the socks, did the testing as appropriately uh, laid out in the view of Dr. Readers, and concluded that those stains were from an EDTA preserved blood source. When you don't bring in that person and you bring in Dr. Readers instead, you've produced far weaker evidence than was available to you, and the jury may draw the logical inference. And the fact is, the defense put on evidence. This is not burden of proof stuff. This is, you decided not to rest on the state of the prosecution case. You decided to put people on. Well, when you put people on and you don't put the best people on, you can have the jury draw a negative inference. And with respect to the coroner, no problem, because by putting on evidence, they could have called Dr. Golden. And I would anticipate whoever argues this case on our behalf to the jury might point that fact out. If he had so much to offer, bring him in. They had the power to do so. So the instruction is a perfectly uh, correct statement of the law, perfectly D10 that is, perfectly appropriate for the argument of counsel. The McKinney instruction is improper. It is uh, an argumentative uh, form of an instruction, and it is, not, it is highlighting a specific area, and we are not by any way, shape, or form going to suggest that the jury should find a negative inference for the defense case from the failure of them to put on more than they did with respect to that material. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, counsel. All right. The offer of D-9 will be rejected. It is not phrased in a neutral manner. I will likewise decline to give the special proposed instruction regarding Laura Hart McKinney. However, if the prosecution chooses to argue the line of argument that Mr. Kelberg has just promised the court that they won't, the court will, will revisit that, and that holds with all instructions. If a contrary argument is made that requires the court to re-instruct. Your Honor, should that event occur, am I excluded from a contempt citation? Uh, if counsel chooses to disregard my representation? You may be, but your boss won't. That is his concern, not okay. exactly mine. Appreciate it. All right. All right, D11. Is it the court's intention to give D10 then? Without the uh, Laura McKinney? I understood you to understand. I understood your position to be that you don't want it if I don't give the Laura Hart McKinney 